episode 174 above ground podcast finding joy and connection with angela disclaimer the host of this podcast timothy patrick and will foley are by no means medical professionals however having lived experience with mental illness themselves they have gained useful perspectives on common mental health issues that some of us struggle to overcome on a daily basis by sharing their stories they hope to create connection By creating connection, they hope to help you find your purpose. And through purpose, we can all begin to build the foundation for positive mental health. This is Above Ground Podcast. Coming at you live with real conversations about mental health from the peer perspective, it's time for Above Ground Podcast. Now your hosts, TPP and Will Foley. Hey, what is up everyone? Welcome to episode 174 Above Ground Podcast, which we're going to get to in a moment. October 23rd, Sunday, October 23rd is Upstate Punk Rock Flea Market at Empire Live in downtown Albany. From noon to 6 p.m., Michael Langione, Langione. I always mess up his name. He'll be a guest on Above Ground Podcast in November, actually. Um, he has an, uh, an incredible story of recovery and things, and uh, he'll be telling he'll be telling everybody about it in November on Above Ground Podcast. But October 23rd, Upstate Punk Rock Flea Market. Looking forward to it. Uh, we'll be stacked right next to Pogo Beard Company, our buddy, down in Pennsylvania making all those cool beard oils and abomination tattoo balm. That's right. Tattoo balm, man. Got to put it on there. Got to put it on all that expensive artwork we all have on our bodies. Also, big news in above ground podcast land. Uh, Our buddy TPP getting ready to drop his book. Uh, He's got a new book coming out that he'll be putting out sometime before the end of the year by Christmas. Uh, As soon as I know the exact date, I will let everyone know. But never underestimate the power of you. Because life is a DIY project. And TPP uh, putting his heart on some paper, man. We're going to get behind it. It's awesome. Can't wait to read it. You'll have to check it out, too, when it comes out. And we'll let you know when that is. Here we go, man. Episode 174. Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to... Above Ground Podcast. Above Ground Podcast, because you can't serve below. What no, up, TPP? <laughs> What's up, Will? What's going on, buddy? Um, you know, not much, not much. No. The usual. The dailies again? Ah, uh, you know, I'm good. <laughs> I'm. I got my boxing gloves on. I'm fighting back. Good. Me too. Me too, man. Me too. As a matter of fact, we're. We're on an odd night for us, so I'm a little bit out of my element, so I'm trying to dial myself back in. Uh, tonight, we have an awesome one. Uh, we are joined by, you might as well say a 518. She's in Newburgh, so it's 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 fairly <laughs> close, and and our New York connections are perfect, so it, it works very well. We are joined tonight by Angela Amoya, who happens to be a licensed marriage and family therapist and she's also a teacher she's a mom she's a phd student in some really cool stuff angela thank you so much for joining us tonight how are you i'm good thank you so much for having me it's great to be here awesome we can't wait to get into this stuff so how did your journey into uh marriage and family practice come to be I kind of have a boring story. A lot of people (laughs) have, (laughs) a lot of people have, um, you know, this profound moment where they decided this is what I'm going to do. And um, I didn't really have that. I went to undergrad undecided. I didn't really know anything. And I took, it was human development and family studies was my major as an undergrad. And I took um, like an intro class as, as an elective. And I totally fell in love with it. I to- it totally resonated with me and um, you know, the dynamics in families and like the emotional component and um, impact on of trauma on people. And so that kind of um, led me on the path to declaring that major. And then, you know, as I worked through my undergrad program, deciding that 
I want to pursue this and, and become a therapist. And so I found a master's program um, and I, I applied to a couple, but um, I wanted to go away. So I, I got into a master's program out in San Diego and I did that for, um, you know, it took me, you know, two, two-ish years and I stayed there for a little bit longer. And then I came back to New York in 2007 I worked a couple different jobs um, at nonprofits, um, primarily in substance abuse with teens, so inpatient, outpatient. And then um, finally in 2009, I went into private practice, seeing teens and some kids. And then eventually my my practice morphed into couples, um, predominantly couples for quite some time. And then it's since morphed, it's, it's had a couple chapters, um, since morphed into um, mostly individuals, adults. Um, and I will also work a lot with the LGBTQ population. I have a bunch of, probably I want to say maybe a quarter, if not more of my practice is trans individuals. And so, you know, working with them in, in terms of their transition and, and that process for them. So yeah, that's that's my story. What is the correlation that you found between trauma and the family dynamic? What is like one thing that you found that you didn't know as you've learned in your private practice about dra- about trauma and families? So much. Um, there's not one thing. Like it's it's <laughs> the, at the root of so much of of our issues because you know when you think about family, we you know that that is our, our first, everything, the first examples of how to be, how to be a man, how to be a woman, how to be a partner, how to be, uh, how to be loved at, you know, and so that's the foundation. And so, um, you know, when, when there's trauma, we have to go back and like chip away at the foundation and dig through and unlearn and relearn. And, and that's, you know, that's so hard, you know, because that, you know, that's, that's our, our quick gut reaction. And so it's, it's, it's so challenging to get control of that and do it different. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's answering your question. That's what came to my mind. (laughs) Oh yeah. No, no, that's, that, that was fine. Yeah. (laughs) It is, it is hard, but I want to add, it is possible. It is. Yes, 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 it is. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. <laughs> I just always have to add add in that because uh, I've seen it. We've t- we've we've been, you know, grateful enough to have been doing this. And, and we were lucky to have numerous people that we've talked with that with trauma and PTSD and and the whole, you know, shebang. And, and we we hear a lot of stories of thrival, which is mm-hmm. just awesome. Have you had families that just can't put it back together? So my experience with families, like working, you know, if you think about like a bunch of people in a therapy office, like I, I, I feel like when I say families, it's more about me working individually with either the kid or the teenager. And then, you know, having like, you know, a session with the parents or a session with mom and the kid or the dad and the kid. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's absolutely hard work, but it's a, it's, I think so much about the willingness to do the work and being open because like, then you get to do it. <laughs> and so, you know, Tim saying it's possible, it, it's, it is, anything's possible, right? But absolutely. We've you know. actually just talked about that recently about how, I, cause somebody had asked, cause a lot of our friends come to us obviously for advice or, you know, what do I do? And the thing about therapy is you have to be willing, first of all, to go to therapy. But if you're going to go to therapy, you have to be willing to be truthful and honest and and put all your shit on the table because what's the sense of doing it if you're just going to, if you're not going to do it that way? Yeah. I was just having a conversation. Actually, my students, uh, the topic, our, our section that we're talking about is therapy and treatment of, of mental health disorders. And, um, they think it's so fun to like ask questions about like my experience as a clinician because the book is boring. Who wants to read a textbook? And so um, they said, do your clients lie to you? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> and um, certainly I guess what's a lie and what's true, you know, like when I have to like think about weeding out, you know, but, you know, it goes back to you, you 
you get out what you put in. But um, I did have a situation where I did confirm the lie. I was working with a couple and a friend of mine was, was the clinician and we had, we were able to speak, we had consent and all of that. And so, um, yes, I did confirm that a client lied to me, but um, yeah, like it's totally about your willingness and, you know, what that lie doesn't do anything for me. What is, what does it do for them? You know? And and so it's keeps them stuck. It keeps them in that same spot. And so, um, you know, and I I think certainly it's hard to do the work, but, um, you know, if you dig and and you work hard, you you get through only way out is through. (laughs) You got that right. What, um, the name of that class, can you say that again, that you're, Oh, it's the, um, just the class that I'm teaching at, um, SUNY orange. Um, so it's just a general psychology class, but our topic, um, oh, the topic. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The topic is therapy. And so treatment approaches to, to mental health disorders. And so we've kind of worked our way up to that point now. And so we were talking about different types of therapy and individual versus family and couple and group and, um, you know, different, uh, different treatment modalities, like cognitive behavioral and humanistic and psychoanalysis and just trying to give them like a little snippet of what each of those were. But, um, so that was the topic we covered, uh, we're covering this week. Do you get a lot of feedback from the students? Yeah, actually this semester has been interesting. Um, I, one of my classes in particular is pretty open about, you know, open about their struggles and open about what they're going through. And we actually had a really, and and Tim, we've talked about this before. We had a really awesome dialogue this morning about how challenging it is to get to therapy. So it's so hard to decide. It's so hard to realize, Hey, wait, I need help. And then it's so hard to be like, okay, I'm going to get help. And then when you call over and over and over again, and they're not accepting your insurance and they're not accepting new clients or they're only self-pay or they don't do telehealth. And that's the only thing you could do or la la la, the list goes on and on. And so talking with my students about that, they were like kind of deer in headlights. They were like, Oh, like it was, it was this like aha moment and talking about the insurance and all of those challenges. Um, that was an interesting conversation because um, I think there's been some progress in terms of destigmatization of mental illness. You know, now we're in a place where it's like, okay, I have, you know, I'm going to reach out, I'm going to get help. And then you can't, or the door shut in your face. And that's the thing that's so heartbreaking because when a client is finally in a position to say, I need help, like just that phone call is so fucking hard. Can I curse? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, no, you're absolutely right. We. That's one of the reasons why I asked you about the topic because I wanted to kind of lead into this because we just talked about this pretty recently just because I'm actually will both, both will and I um, are now going to be forced to look for a new therapist because we had the same therapist for, for uh, he, he's been seeing her for a little while and I just started um, only two sessions, but she had to, had to leave or, you know, cancel everything. So um and I've talked to you about this and it's like, you know, thankfully I'm in a position where I'm like, okay, here's more hurdles. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's a little, uh, it's, it's not a full gut, gut punch, but it, you know, it's a little slap in the face for sure. Because you're like, okay, now I have to start the process all over again. And you're calling four to five people or looking them up online and emailing them. Nobody emails you back, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's like, and I get it. Like I said, I understand that on, on your side of things, you guys are overwhelmed and, and just overbooked, you know? So, but for somebody that may not have that little bit of knowledge, it's, right. it's, it could be that, you know, like, Hey, I made this effort. And then after that, no, here, you know, or Hill or whatever, they're, they're done. Like, okay, yeah. well, forget it. I, I tried. And now I'm like, yeah. you know, it's, it's just going to push them away and be like, ah, therapy's not for me. And it's like, it was kind of an unfair shot, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like, you know, people um, who don't realize, you know, they, they, and I think because, um, you know, like you call the doctor for whatever's going on and you get a receptionist and then, 
you know, you, you make an appointment, even if I feel like doctors are booked up months too, but you make an appointment and then, you know, you go to the appointment. And so like therapists often are so different unless you go to like a big group practice that has a receptionist and, um, you know, and so, um, when people don't, you know, don't know that, or don't realize that like, oh, look, even this person can't help me. Like, uh, you know, and then that, that depression is, they just sink even lower. Is insurance a major barrier? Do you accept insurance? And is, cause again, like I, I think, and have we been like sort of snow jobbed into believing that insurance is like this big benefit, but yet you go to a doctor and doctors only spend 15 minutes with you now. And, and they have to, they have to make sure that they plug everything into the computer and stuff. So you don't really even get to talk to a doctor necessarily about your stuff because they're too busy filling in the little forms. But again, most people have insurance and private pay is a, is, is more of a a burden because if you're paying for insurance, you want people to accept your insurance. So how do we, how do we combat that? We just had this conversation. I know. I just went on a giant rant. (laughs) She filled me in on some stuff that I was just like, I wanted to throw my phone. I'm like, yeah, I can't even, but like, I get it now after she explained it, but I just wanted to throw my two cents in here real quick, Angela, before you answer this. But, um, and I told her the same thing. It's like I've called or I've looked up people and they, and they don't take insurance. And in my head, I'm like, oh, man, why why would you not take insurance? I'm, and, I'm, and I immediately go to that like judgment of, oh, they just want more money or they just. But then Angela explained to me the the nonsense that you have to deal with when you're dealing with these big insurance companies. And it's just blasphemy. I can't even think of a better word. So I'll just I'll let her take take the mic but i just i needed to say that yeah because we just had this conversation (laughs) um insurance is quite a headache so yes well i do take some insurances i do that because i i want to help people and i want to help people who need help. And that's not to say that people with a bunch of money who can pay out of pocket don't need help. But if I needed weekly therapy, I go bi-weekly, but if I was going weekly and I had to pay out of pocket, I couldn't afford it. I'm, I'm a single mom. I got two little ones. Right. And so I don't, I can't like in, I don't know, ethically or morally, I cannot expect people to pay, um, out of pocket. And some, some people might say, well, you don't value yourself. You don't value what you do. And I just, it's gross to me. Like I, I don't know. So for me, that's why I take insurance. But that said, I despise it. I, if you bill the wrong code, you don't get paid. If you don't bill in the right time frame, you don't get paid. Um, I was telling my students um, that insurances, um, some insurance, so there's mental health parity now. And so that means that mental health is treated as um, a medical issue. Brains, part of our body sounds fantastic, but a lot of insurance companies have created like extra like loopholes or hurdles. And so you might have a higher deductible, often a higher copay for mental health. And so, um, one of my, actually a client, my five o'clock client and I just, um, switched insurance. She's fresh out of college. She's like pumped on her like new job and she has her own insurance and her copay for individual sessions is $70. Do you offer sliding scale? Do you, is it, is that how it works? So uh, one more thing about insurance, um, too, that, that, um, is, I think sometimes maybe a reason that clinicians, um, just choose not to use insurance is that when you credential with an insurance company, they send you back, um, your contract and they say, this is what we're going to pay you. And oftentimes, you know, sometimes it's $60, sometimes it's 75. And so, um, you know, those are okay rates. They're pretty typical insurance rates. Since COVID, the rates are going up, which is really helpful. But for a lot of clinicians, they can get 
100 or 125, you know, if they have to feed their family and if this is their only source of income, you know, and, and so I certainly don't knock them for, you know, and it's no paperwork. You see the person, they give you the payment and off we go. I am in a situation, I was credentialed with an insurance company for over a decade. Um, My billing person um, made a mistake on the paperwork for the recredentialing. And um, it was during COVID. I was, you know, as everyone was struggling, single mom, I was still working, trying to do homeschool, blah, blah, blah. Right. So anyway, an error was made. We're human. And they kicked me off the insurance panel. Now I've had clients through them and was getting paid through them for five, six years. And so again, morals kick in and I'm not going to just say, Hey, sorry, I can't see you anymore. Like I thought they would, you know, we'd resolve it. We'd, they'd throw me back on the panel. We'd figure it out. And, uh, that's me being naive and maybe way too nice. Um, and they didn't, and it's over a year. So I saw three clients for a year without getting any reimbursement and I've appealed the insurance company. So I'm going through that whole process. I finally was repaneled with them. So I'm at least getting paid for those clients now, but like just shit like that. So that one error like is like over $10,000. And I'm a single mom and <laughs> she got it, you know, like $10,000 is kind of a lot of money. So it's, it's, that's a dramatic example. That certainly doesn't happen all the time, but it, it highlights very well how, if you don't cross your T's and dot your I's, insurances can definitely fuck you over. And it's really a lot. It's a challenge and it's a challenge for, for everyone. You know, it's a challenge for us on the, you know, the, the provider side and then billing and, you know, calling and then you're on the hold for an hour. And then it's, it's a challenge for, for the, the clients too, you know, and it just sucks. (laughs) Well, I was uh, recently talking with Angela about um, some stuff that we had talked about numerous times you know just mentioning the peer support and um you know she said something to me that really and it did i never even thought of it you may have but it was just like i'm i'm not really in tune with the whole um addiction recovery side but she was like for some reason it's like fully acceptable for for that side to use peers whereas the mental health side almost not, I don't want to say non-existent, but they don't u- utilize peers as much as they should. Timmy, to answer you, I think because the reason why peers work so well in the recovery side of it is because of things like AA. See, in recovery, those things have been around forever. Mental health has such the stigma and mental illness. How do you feel about peer support, Angela? Do you think it's, do you think it's very valuable? Well, that's, yeah, I, I, I just, the conversation that, that Tim and I were having, I was comparing it to, because in my first like ever experience as a therapist um, was a substance abuse support specialist at um, a high school. And so I, that kind of started my substance abuse journey. And then, you know, I, I stayed there and then I worked out patients um, and then I was residential and then I was inpatient. And so what I was saying about the peer support was that I feel at times was more beneficial in terms of recovery than me, a, a therapist with some, some education and some letters, you know, that peer support and, and that ability to connect and I've been there and I know how you feel. And, and, um, I, I saw it, some of the, the staff were, you know, had, um, had, you know, struggled with it, with their own, um, substance abuse, uh, issues. And they went on and they got a KSAC, um, which is the, um, certification through, through New York. And so they were working and they were staffed there. And so their ability to connect, it was different, not better, not worse. Um, you know, in, in some instances, certainly, you know, my experience had a different role, but so, so seeing that, and then, you know, again, the normalization from AA and NA and existing for so long, and then thinking about how that doesn't at all exist with mental health. And so Tim had said, you know, while you're on 
I hope this is okay to share, you know, you're on a wait list. And like, while you're on a wait list waiting to get an appointment, um, even if you're not in crisis, but to, to be able to talk to someone, to have a normalizing um, experience and to feel heard and to feel validated um, would be amazing. And, and, you know, you know, maybe it's not digging and maybe it's not this big, uh, you know, therapeutic, uh, I don't know, intervention, but sometimes just being heard and, and having, um, someone hold space for you is, is so, so powerful. So I definitely think peer support, uh, could be really beneficial and, um, you know, it's, it's, it is different. And I, 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 I feel like it stands out, um, thinking about it, how different it is. And that could be um, some of the problem right there is that no one really knows because as you both said, AA has been kind of a staple, you know, for years and years where this is still maybe fairly new to some people. I want to touch on something very interesting that you are doing if, if you're cool with talking about your PhD studies. You are in a PhD program right now to be able to do psychedelic assisted therapies. Yeah. So can you yes. tell us about that? And I, how did this come about? That's what yeah, I'm really I'll, curious I'll about. Whole, <laughs> I'll give you the whole intro. A couple of years ago, I was teaching um, death and dying at a, a different college that I, I um, sometimes uh, teach for. And um, it was solely online. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not getting a textbook. How am I going to make this awesome and engaging? And so I was like scouring the internet for documentaries and things like that. And so I came across um, the documentary about uh, the NYU and UCLA um, studies with um, cancer patients. And so um, working with those individuals with their um, death anxiety using psychedelics. And um, I believe those studies did use psilocybin. So I was super intrigued and it kind of sparked my, um, my interest into psychedelic assisted therapy and seeing, um, different studies going on and how effective they, they were in, in many instances and how powerful they were. And so, you know, I, I also, it stood out how powerful they were in such a short period of time. Um, I work all, I, you know, I feel like everyone has trauma, but a lot of my clients have a PTSD diagnosis and in terms of improvement and progress, it's talking about a snail's pace, you know, it's, it's so slow. And so one of the, the, the draws for me was this looking at these so so that they have these preparation sessions and you meet and then you have a dosing session and an integration set and and so each of the studies are set up differently but um you know there's there's these dosing sessions and sometimes it takes one session to to then do you know go on to do the integration work and it is not a miracle here. I think that's really important for me to share because there is so much hype about psychedelic assisted therapy is going to replace psychiatrists. And so um, that's really, really important for, for me to convey. This is certainly not for everyone, but um, the research was pretty, um, pretty impressive. And so kind of led me down, down the road to, you know, digging more and reading more and learning more and kind of deciding like, wow, I, I want to get involved in this. I want to, I want to learn more and, and I want to do this. And so, um, there was a couple of programs that I had found and, um, I connected with, um, one of the, um, women, she was one of the nurses that participated, that was, um, um, a researcher in the NYU study. She's in Kingston, New York. And so I connected with her and, um, asked her like, you know, I'm just a therapist, you know, I, I don't have much experience, but you know, any suggestions as far as, you know, kind of programs and training so that I can have the education, um, to do this work. And she had, uh, recommended the program that I'm actually in. And I looked into that program and I, 
you know, when like you, you find something and like your whole body tingles and like, you just feel this like intense energy, like just looking at the website of this program, like that happened. And I was like starstruck and, and it was just such a cool, um, I don't know. It was really cool. And, and so I applied and, um, or no, I'm sorry. Um, the applications weren't open. So I applied to a different program and I was like, yeah, it's just not meant to be. And I didn't get into that program. And so I did a couple of workshops. I took some classes and then I applied again when the applications were open. And so here I am in the program. And so it worked out the way it needed to be. Right. That's, that's kind of, you know, the steps that kind of led me here. And so, um, Right now it is um, primarily online and, um, you know, there's, there's uh, two to three, um, 10 to, to 15 day experiential um, components. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know, does that answer your question? <laughs> it's kind of a big story. I, I'm really interested to hear what, what do you think I obviously, I, I don't know if you have, and I don't even know if I can ask this question, but I'm going to ask it and you can, and you can say, I don't want, I decline to answer, but why do you think that, was it just the documentary? Do you have any personal experience with, so yeah, with plant <laughs> medicines so at all? Cause, and it was interesting that you said this because like you said, it's not a cure all. Like it's not a panacea, it's not, but it's a tool and it can be a useful tool under the right circumstances. What do you think is the, the thing that really helps make um, psychedelic assisted therapy work so quickly? Why do you think that is? You know, there's research that's, you know, doing studies on the, what happens to our brain when we have a psychedelic experience. And so, um, you know, I certainly think that's a component of it, but the other piece is the, the, how do you like it, it just because it's so magical. No, that's, that's not my answer. <laughs> that, that, that was a very, know. that was a very layman term, right? Or lay woman term right there. So magical. <laughs> you you are, I, I can, I can understand with my past experiences, if I had someone there to guide me to actually like in a, in a, in a way to really get to the core of things, I, I'm a pretty self, I'm a pretty introspective guy. I've, and I've learned to be pretty introspective and I, you know, I, I, I have a little bit of experience with these things. And I would like to have more of an experience with these things, even on my own. But I also wouldn't necessarily know how to ask myself the right questions to get me thinking about things. And it, that I find is where the biggest benefit is, is to have somebody guiding you as a mm -hmm. guide. Mm -hmm. how, yeah. And so how would you guide somebody on that if you know what I mean? So this actually, you you asking that question kind of answers the the previous question too. You know, the idea behind um, this work is, it, and it sounds a little woo woo, but um, I truly believe it. Is I'm that, all about woo woo. I'm I'm I truly <laughs> am. I truly am. Like I'm an energy guy. Like and you know right. things that things that I feel like people would be like, what are you talking about? You know, no, just right. surrender. <laughs> yes <laughs> but um this there's this idea that the medicines give you what you need right and so part of me doing this program is essentially shutting the hell up and not talking which is as you may have gathered it's a little challenging um but um you know, as I, as I'm learning more like the, the academic stuff and having my own experiences um, the last time um, that I, I had a, a pretty um, high dose, I cocooned in a bed by myself and I didn't want to talk to anyone. And I was doing so much work, like shame and, and like, just like body image. And like, I had these chapters of like, like it was like 10 years in, I was like, well, I don't know what year it is, let alone what time it is. And so I, um, I also think 
you know, everyone's experience is so vastly different um, that I can't not agree that that we go where we need to go, even if it's scary. There's lots of things coming out about a bad trip. And, um, you know, there's this really a big piece of integration work after is that there is no bad trip. There's you, you got what you needed and how do we make meaning out of that? And, um, certainly there's terrifying, hard experiences, um, you know, but if there's a way through what the only way out was through, if there's a way through it to make meaning, it can be a profound shift. Um, so did I ask to answer? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it, you, you hit the magic word integration and I, I'm really like, that's the one thing that I've started to really learn on the deep work that I've been doing on myself is that it's hard to integrate some of the things that I've learned about myself. And how do we integrate? Like, do you need a professional? Because I will say this, after therapy sessions, you need integration a lot of times. So I can only imagine after a psychedelic assisted treatment where your emotions and, and those barriers are down. And I, I, you know, I, going back to the experiences that I've had, I can understand why they would work so well because you are, I mean, it's just an intense flood of you feel everything and you feel everything times, you know, 10 times 50 times a hundred, depending on who you are and, and what your, what plant medicine you're working with or what psychedelic you're working with. Cause there's a difference. And, it, how do you start to integrate anything? How do you even, how do you get your clients to integrate the things that they learn in therapy? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think kind of jumping back a little bit, do you need a therapist to integrate? No. Um, I, I think you need maybe someone, I think, or, or a space to feel heard. Um, maybe like journal, like really like I'm going to journal and like really, you know, throw myself into this and like uh, spend time. But I don't think you, you necessarily need a, a therapist to, um, to integrate things that you're learning about yourself with psychedelics. Um, you know, when people are coming when they have an issue and they, they decide they want to use plant medicine to address it. There's, there's a, there's a protocol that exists now. I mean, I think that it continues to morph as research is done and as it's continuing, but um, you know, the idea behind it is, you know, you build that rapport and you, you prepare, right. And that's, that's the preparation sessions. And because with psychedelics, like I said, um, it, it, all three of us could take, the same, the, the same dose of the, of the same plant and have such different experiences. So during the preparation, it's about, um, certainly intention setting. What do I want to get out of this? What is my hope? Um, uh, explaining and educating that you might not get that <laughs> and, you know, talking about things that could potentially happen, but also setting up, um, the set and the setting, you know, those are, you know, where you are, uh, who you're with, what, you know, what, what plant medicine you're going to take, what dosage you're going to take. Um, and then the headspace and the mindset of that individual. And, um, you know, I think that's why I could go on and on about FDA, but that's, that's why it's been so challenging to get FDA approval for, for these, these, um, medicines, because it's, it's not antibiotics, you know, like it's because the, the outcomes can range so much. And so all of these research studies are trying to control all the variables and it's so hard, but MAPS is an organization that they are 
they're the furthest along, right? Um, they're doing the work for MDMA assisted therapy, working with PTSD and they're in phase three. So they're hopeful that they are going to continue that process and get the FDA approval for MDMA to be used for um, PTSD. Um, ketamine is also already approved. There's ketamine, um, you know, ketamine clinic clinics popping up. Um, and so jumping back though, the, the set and the setting is, is, um, really, really important. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's a, a big chunk of the work. And then after, um, you know, after the individual has, you know, their, their, um, experience, you know, really diving in and helping them process what they learned, normalizing some of the stuff that was, weird or, uh, scary or really hard or uncomfortable, um, you know, and letting them kind of, um, dig in and, and where do we plug those things in, into our life now? Um, you know, um, it, when, when it's a pretty profound experience, I think, uh, you know, what you said about it can actually, you should be taken in the same way as, as therapy, you know, regular therapy or psychotherapy or any kind of healing growth work is should be you know what's your intention and you know journal journal down what you know as if you were like you know setting a goal write down your goal be yeah. clear and concise and and again environment having the the people around you who are going to support you and support yes. that you know that journey that you're on at that part you know from what i've seen it could be could be missing a little bit from the regular you know the other therapy side of it is it possible that they're so afraid of the fact that people could have such profound experiences that it turns the whole thing upside down in reality i think so me too I, like i said i don't think you it's said a it, what right it's not a panacea but you said exactly what i've heard like aubrey marcus talk about on his podcast and and i've heard rick rick doblin or rick doblin or whatever talk yeah, about it. yeah and and i've been reading a lot about this stuff i'm i'm interested in it myself and and for the reasons of that i really want to peel the onion back and figure out why i'm fucked up or why i think i'm yeah. fucked up anyway and i i and i've often thought that I think a lot of it is is that they're afraid that if people started to take the blinders away and that's yeah. the one thing the plants do and you said it exactly the plants give you exactly what you need whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah. See and and, yeah. and let me let me let me play devil's advocate for a second though is is you know are are people ready for that? I mean, you know, you can't even get people to go to to regular therapy and and you can't even get somebody to look in the mirror. And be like, no. you know what? You yeah. actually have what it takes inside of you to do some healing, and and that's, you know they just want that pill. They want they want something that's you know give me. I'll uh, sell them the five easy steps. There is no fucking five easy steps. There is no key because it ain't locked, man. Right. But and they don't want to listen to that. And the funny <laughs> thing is, is that I think the biggest thing is, is that I think if people really learn about themselves, then that means they have to actually take fucking responsibility. And that's the biggest fear. That's the, it's not the fear of, of the bad trip. It's the fear that they have to actually take responsibility and be like, oh, fuck. I just woke mm -hmm. up and I'm like, oh, my God, I could have been all this. And now I have to integrate all this to figure out where I'm going next. Yeah. The only thing that, that for me... Um, that kind of, and, and it goes back to what Angela was saying about the FDA is that, which I, I just don't know. There's so many different outcomes, right? Like you were saying, like everybody's experience is different. So that for me personally, it makes me a little bit like, oh, okay. Cause like, you don't know, you don't know what, yeah. you know, but it, 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 I guess if you have like a smaller dose and, and, and a trained uh, person to guide you, then yeah, it, it could be fine. But I think that for me is like a, whoa, that that's a little nerve wracking. But I think that that's a great example of like, okay, so I, I've been in private practice since 2009 and I am not doing psychedelic therapy. Certainly it's illegal, I'm not doing anything illegal, <laughs> but um, it's also, I, I did a, a 
certification to do integration work. So I can do preparation. I can't say where to go, what dose. I can't talk about that, but we can prepare for, I'm going to do this thing. Okay. What's that going to look like? What's that going to feel like? What do you hope for? So I can do that work and then I can do after the integration work. So do your thing, come back. Let's talk. What did you do? You did this thing. What did you learn? And I can do that work, but I've not yet done it yet because like not, not very many, even of my clients know, you know, we're just doing the therapy thing and not many of my clients know that I'm doing this whole, whole new, new thing. And, um, so to, you know, it, it, it isn't going to be for everyone. You know, I think people certainly need to, um, I don't know, understand it and, and, um, be open to it and, you know, be maybe interested in, um, you know, altered states of consciousness or, you know, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's definitely, you know, not necessarily something that everyone just should run out and do. Um, you know, I think it, it needs to be taken seriously. Um, yeah, no, I think I like what Will said is that it's a tool, you know, and, and I'm all for tools. So, you know what I mean? Like the more tools, the better I feel like it. So, and like you said, some, you know, you know, Reiki is not for everybody, you know, Tai Chi is not for everybody. Yoga, uh, you know, this stuff is not for everybody. So certain yeah. things might, you know what I mean? And if it can help certain people, I'm for it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's yeah. never, it's never one thing, you know, it's never one right. thing that's going to go, you got to do therapy. You got to medication. You got to, it's just your whole lifestyle has to change. It, yes. If you, you know, if that's what you want. And that's it. If that's what you want, you know, you have to put in the effort and make the changes and. Right. And that's them. right. And that's what I was saying earlier about like the intention, like some people go to therapy and they're, and you know, granted, I'm not saying they right off the bat if if it's their first time and stuff they should know but like Mm. you know somewhere down the line you should have some kind of intention of you know i want to grow or i want to heal or i want to heal this specific thing and you know obviously when we uncover things more things appear you know so then you know there's more uncovering of other things but you know you it's just to, to have that kind of intention or you know something specific to, to look forward or to work towards, I guess. Right. I think set setting an intention is important in anything though, that we do, especially when it comes to, to this type of work. And I'm not just talking about psychedelic assisted therapy. I'm talking about therapy in general. Cause, yeah. because it can really, I mean, I will say I've had some, you know, it's just like this with anything. It's like, you can have one experience where, you know, everything's great. And then the next thing you're ugly crying for the next three days and you don't know why. I, I mean, you know, that's the way it is. It, but yeah, I think, it's, no, I think you're right. I, I, I think that, and I've said this before is if, you know, whether it's your job, whether it's uh, a relationship, whether whatever it is, if you're going into it with good intentions, you know what I mean? Then uh, it's saving you. It, it's almost like a boundary where it's for you. You're setting an intention for you. Like I didn't intend to, to hurt you. I didn't intend to, to shame or guilt you. Okay. So let's talk about it and then understand what I can do differently. You know, that way it's okay. Well, there's intention behind it. So if you do something with an open heart, with good intentions, it, I think it matters. It doesn't always change the outcome though. But it's no, good. But, but it's good. But that, that's it's good to put it out me. there, though. Yeah, the good. outcome is out of our control. We shouldn't even worry about the outcome. We should worry about ourselves and our response, and you know, all of that, all of that stuff. The, like the the whatever happens is going to happen anyways. There's no control over that. Mm-hmm. It's how we, you know we react to it is is what we have to control. Uh, we always talk about tools and and we we did just talk about some tools and um but what do you do as as angela the person um what what do you do you know do you have music what what do you do for as far as self-care i don't know the first thing that comes to mind is it's cheesy because it's so like mainstream right now, but mindfulness and i say that meaning um just an awareness of what's going on with me what are my reactions? Why am I reacting this way? Trying to slow things down when I can, 
uh, in the whirlwind that life is right. Um, um, other, other things, yoga, I, I, I do yoga. I do Reiki. I just got my Reiki certification. So when I get Reiki, I feel pretty good. Um, my friends and are just like my everything talking, you know, inventing and, um, having fun, laughing, finding joy. Yeah. I sound like a cheesy website. <laughs> you sound like, you sound like one of the self-help websites that everybody goes to, but it's okay though, because that's the thing that, that's the thing about all this is that all these things have always been there. But we get co so caught up in our own drama and our own pain and our own in our own prison because that's the one yeah. that's the insight that I've had recently that you know in reality, man, I'm the only one that can get me out of my own prison. Like I'm the one I can reach outside the outside the thing and unlock it anytime yeah. I want. And why yeah. do I want to stay in it? And it's because it's comfortable because it's not challenging. It's just like you know. It's, it's, it's what you know. I know it, right? It's comfortable. It's like my it's like my Black Sabbath T shirt. It's 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 comfortable. <laughs> Angela, do you have a favorite or a least favorite word? All right, I have to uh, share with you guys that since I've been listening to the podcast, um, I so I teach, and so when I take attendance, because I'm a therapist and I like brave connection. Even if it's like this much with my students, I ask them a question and then they answer it when I call their name or they share. And that's how I mark attendance. And so just the other day, I asked this question to my students thinking of you guys. <laughs> and so uh, they all had to answer their favorite or their least favorite word. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but I think my favorite word is connection. I think about that a lot. I talk about that a lot. It applies personally, professionally, as a parent, as a friend, as a therapist. So I think that's that's my favorite word. It's very important to me. And I think to everyone, to us, all of us. Think about one of the biggest themes that, that people get after a psychedelic experience is the interconnectedness of us all. And so um, that may be another reason why I'm so drawn to this work, but connection is my answer for my favorite word. That's awesome. Because I you may actually be the first person that said connection in that, yeah. in that sense, I think, in that sense. How about a least favorite word? Hate is coming to mind, but like, does everyone say that? No. No. No, not, not really. Think yeah may usually, have had one or two usually if it's a woman it's you know one of a couple of words or something that they can't that they can't stand <laughs> all and, right we can mostly... start over and do a whole feminist talk <laughs> if you want i'll go there with you. so fast <laughs> um i kind of like to do jazz moves i improvise a lot as far as this question goes because when this started out i was i always ask about people's pets and animals because animals are super important in our recovery and in our lives and they are family members but i want to i'm ask i want to change it up and i want to ask you what is one thing that you've learned about yourself that you didn't know by being a therapist i don't know how to pick one um or 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 give me you know give us a couple you know what i mean don't you don't have to pick just one but if there's a couple of things that stick out to you yeah. that like wow i really did not know that about myself before i started this pra before i started practice or, or we can even condense it down even further. What is something that you didn't know from working in outpatient, inpatient residence to starting your own practice? Can I answer the first one? Because absolutely, um, I, absolutely. I was trying so to give you. I was trying to give you a wiggle worm way out of it. it. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the thing that I've learned is that no matter who you are where you're from, what you have, what you don't have, what you do, we all have fucked upness. And that is my clinical term. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, I've had conversations, um, you know, with many people, Tim being one of them about how, um, you know, growing up, you know, you, you respected authority and you had to listen to the professional and you, you listen to the teacher and you listen to the doctor. And they, they were like these all knowing beings in a sense. And I have definitely learned that uh, doctors and teachers and other therapists all have their own stuff. Um, 
which is normalizing and validating, um, you know, because I certainly have my own stuff too. So that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, the stuff is called the human condition. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> if there was something that you would like to see done or that you could do without any restraints for mental health as a whole, what would it be? A shit ton of funding for programs to get rid of barriers to access um, mental health services. I think that's, you know, whether it be in the insurance avenue or, you know, the the amount of clinicians that exist or programs, um, you know, I think that's 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 the biggest thing that comes to mind. Do you do you think that there's one barrier that's bigger than the others or are they all pretty colossal because i they to me they seem pretty colossal depending on where you are in the spectrum of all that so i mean if you don't have money to seek therapy then you, there's no sense and you need it but if you can't find a therapist so I'm, I'm wondering if one barrier is bigger than the other or if or if we're almost comparing traumas by asking about the barriers being bigger than another i think an but this is my my perspective as a private practice clinician is insurance because it gives me problems and it gives them problems and if 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 everyone had access it, you know if if there was universal health care and that's a whole other issue but if everyone was able to go to a therapist and get what they need and the therapist was able to be adequately reimbursed and that was a seamless, um, I don't know, a, 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 a seamless thing, um, you know, than that. So I think it's insurance, um, whether it's people unable to get insurance, unable to afford insurance, or like my, my client tonight, she's pumped on her job and pumped on her own new insurance plan. And the, the poor kid now has to pay $70 per visit. So, um, you know, I think that those, or, or someone who has, uh, I have a $6,000 deductible. Like, am I ever even going to meet that? I'm just paying out of pocket for everything. So it, it's, it's insurance if I had to pick one, but that's personal and professional perspective. And thank you thank for you. taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having but, me. I'm glad we were able to figure it out. Timmy. Wow. Cool. Wow. Awesome conversation, I, Angela, kicking ass and 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 learning all about herself and everything about the world and her experiences. It's awesome, man. I'm glad that we have professionals out there who who put themselves completely into this and are like willing to go to those depths to just figure right. out how to offer other services to and other tools to people that need them. Very cool. I think, like like you said, by you know by by her you know, getting to know herself better and, and, and looking within, I think that makes her a, not only a better person, but a better therapist. Oh, absolutely. She, she's able to help more people, reach more people at a, at a higher level. So, you know, absolutely, man. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for listening to above ground podcast. Be well, be safe, be above thank you for giving us a listen new episodes every wednesday if you listen on apple podcast you can share rate review and even subscribe so you'll never miss an episode other ways to support the show follow us on social media share the content share our episodes you can also buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash above ground pod for further concerns show ideas or just to say hi you can email us at above ground podcast at gmail once again thank you for listening and supporting mental health keep the conversation going and stay above